Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Today on this special edition of The Microscopists, I'm joined by Lucy Collinson at the, from the Francis Crick Institute and Kirk Zismek from the Donald Danforth Plant Science Centre. And we discussed the waves that Volume EM is starting to make. For the last few years, we've called what's happening a quiet revolution um, because it's been a bit under the radar with the Nobel Prizes in super resolution light microscopy and in prior electron microscopy. But I think we can say it's arrived now. How enthusiastic and helpful the Volume EM community is. You know, the reality is, is that it really depends on the biological question and which tool is appropriate. And to someone just walking into this tomorrow, it may not be obvious. So definitely reach out. I mean, it can be myself or Lucy or even um, the Volume EM community. You can send off a little note and you'll get lots of feedback from people who care. And what publications should you go and look at if you're just getting started? But I think uh, Lucy has uh, put out a primer last year. Yeah, so that was in Nature uh, Reviews Methods Primers. We were really lucky. We got some key experts from across the Volume EM pipeline to write on it. So. All in this episode of The Microscopist. Hi, welcome to this special version of The Microscopist. So I'm Peter O'Toole from University of York, and today I'm joined by Kirk Zimmick from Danforth Centre and Lucy Collington from Crick, and we're going to be talking all about volume EM. And if you know a lot about volume EM, you may learn a bit more. If you know nothing about volume EM, hopefully you'll learn how it may be relevant to you. Kirk, Lucy, how are you both? Very good, thanks. How are you? No, I've got, I'm good. Kirk, how are you? I'm great, Peter, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> well, I, I'm, let's kick this off, actually. I, I'm going to kick this off because this is a big thing. If you've never heard about volume EM, this was actually, I think, one of nature's seven technologies to watch, which kind of means in the next seven years, a Nobel Prize will probably be given for volume EM. So, so I've got to ask first, Lucy Kerr, who, who, who's going to get that Nobel Prize? Oh, <laughs> you know, we can't name names like that because we'd probably get it wrong and somebody would be offended. But it's very exciting that it was in nature and it's it's not just one of the named as one of the seven technologies to watch in 2023 but it was also along things like the james webb space telescope and high resolution radiocarbon dating and crispr and so we all like to call for the last few years we've called what's happening a quiet revolution um because it's been a bit under the radar with the Nobel Prizes in super resolution light microscopy and in cryo electron microscopy. But I think we can say it's arrived now. Oh, that's a cool answer. And I, I do think we will be ending up in that Nobel direction at some point. If you think about those techniques, you've compared them to the super res, the cryo EM. Nobel Prizes have been awarded there. You've talked about all the other things that are in those seven technologies. They're making huge waves. And this is this is for the biologist. This is it. You know, this, this is a big thing. It's what we're going to be seeing a lot more of, but it's not easy to get into. So I'm, I'm going to start first, maybe asking Kirk, why? What, what is volume EM? Well, I guess to put it simply is, is that um, we want to see structure inside of cells that are at a nanoscale. Most things inside of a cell are smaller than the human eye can see by far. And so we would use a technique called electron microscopy that can see these small features. Um, the challenge is, is that, of course, cells form tissues and tissues form organisms. So looking at very small structures, generally you can only look at a small area at a time. But volume EM allows us to extend that to larger volumes greater than a micron, um, actually into um, tens of microns, hundreds of microns, and even millimeters. Of course, a millimeter is one thousandth of a meter for those who don't use that part of the ruler very often. I, I, I've thrown a picture up. So actually, if you, I know most of you will be listening to this podcast, but there is a YouTube that will actually have some movies and some images 
that will actually demonstrate uh, what we'll talk about today. So I do encourage you to go and just have a quick, even if you skim through it really fast, don't forget you can play it at one and a half times speed on YouTube. So you don't have to lift and listen to me, which is on so much. But there's several different techniques, isn't there, Kirk, on this? Yeah. Um, so just to extend what I was saying a few moments ago, what we have to do with our samples is, is that we have to fix them or immobilize them and um, stain them with uh, chemistry that allow us to see them by the electron microscopes. Uh, one example for scanning electron microscopy is where you will fix the materials. You'll put these metal stains in them. You embed them in a plastic, which you can section. And one of the most common techniques, uh, actually the lowest cost of entry is called array tomography, where you can actually collect ribbons of sections and then reconstruct those slices into a 3D volume. Um, yes, exactly. So you can do that both on the transmission electron microscope or the scanning electron microscope. Exactly. And so these techniques now allow you to use um, ribbons in the TEM or the SEM. And the, what's nice about this particular approach, again, array tomography, is, is that the sections are, it's non-destructive, meaning you can probe or interrogate those sections. You can image them in different types of microscopes, even light microscopes, and get chemical information using fluorescence and combine them back together. And then when you're done, you can create these large volumes, which is, again, is the characteristic hallmark of volume EM, uh, much greater than a micron, oftentimes tissues and whole organisms. Now, I'm sure we're going to come back to this movie later, but I'm going to drop it in now because I think it's relevant to if, you, if you're watching, if you're listening, to give you an idea of what this can do today. Uh, you, you, you forwarded a movie, so go, go watch. But Kirk, so, so what, come on, describe besides look at my head blowing up. Yeah, so this is actually a single algae cell. And what you're seeing is all the little planes that are, that are acquired in these serial sections. And then, of course, we can segment out the structures inside that are biologically irrelevant. In the case on the left, the purple, um, for those who can't see, is a chloroplast, which is responsible for photosynthesis. And the cyan-colored structure is the nucleus. So you can see all the structures, the texture. And inside, also, the yellow is the Golgi body, which is involved with secretion in the cell. So all of these are put together and captured in a full volume. We have all of the context, the spatial information, of course, you can look at other important cell structures like mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum. Whatever we can contrast, we can go in and segment and then find their spatial relationships. And just as importantly, pathologies, because a lot of times we're looking at disease and we want to know the difference between a disease cell and a healthy cell. That's cool. And, and I, lo I love your descriptions of the colors. It reminded me of watching snooker, listening to snooker on the radio when they said they're screwing back from the red to go for the black ball next. Just like... For me, it works, okay? <laughs> Having listened to snooker for many, for many, many years. So, okay, so that's what it can do. Where did it start? Lucy? Well, for me, it started back with um, the worm. So very small organism called C. elegans. Um, don't try and spell it. So back when I was back at the LMCB in London, um, I was collaborating with a group who wanted to do electron microscopy on the worm. And they you need volume. Normally back then you were talking about imaging 2D planes in a transmission EM, but to go through something like the worm, you need to start moving into volume. And um, back in the 1980s, uh, Sidney Brenner's team published the structure of the nervous system of the nematode C. elegans, otherwise known as the mind of the worm. And um, I was lucky enough to go to New York to David Hall's lab at Albert Einstein and um, have a look at the original data that they collected. So they went through the entire nervous system of the worm by collecting serial sections, about 10,000 of them, um, and then imaging them one by one in the transmission electron microscope. And if you lose even just a few sections during that effort, then you'll lose your connections through to the neurons. So in the end, it was an effort that took around 10 years. And I spent a week in a small room with all of the original printed micrographs. So David's lab was in the process of scanning them and putting them up online so other people could analyze them. Um, so, so, so how were the images captured? Were they photographs then? 
So there was a transmission electron microscope, but it was onto film and then the fil film would have been printed, which was how we did it when I started as well, which makes you very selective about what you take images of, not like a digital camera where you snap everything because you have to develop everything and print it out. So these were the, the real printed micrographs, which have all of the hand labeled annotation on them to say which neuron is which, and then following them from section to section. So the work that was done then in 10 years would probably take us less than two weeks now on the more automated systems that Kurt was talking about. And actually, we're now in the era of the, the mind of the fly. So there are really big groups across the world in the US, at, for example, Janina and in the UK at the LMB and many other places gradually um, increasing the, the volumes that can be imaged and even more difficult, reconstructed and analyzed. And what we're seeing now is that the techniques are not just used in neuroscience, but they're the increases in speed and um, resolution and analysis are pushing out through cell biology, through plants and marine life. You've got some um, infectious organisms on the bottom left there and right out into the cl clinic. So there's some beautiful work on uh, breast cancer uh, samples from patients on the right. I don't, I don't, just, 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 just for clarity. So obviously, you were using photographic film when you started all those very many years ago, Lucy. Uh, <laughs> no comments. <laughs> I think you've got. I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I can't talk. Uh, I'm a, <laughs> uh, but uh, obviously, now you're using digital cameras. Yeah. How much do the digital cameras cost? Well, digital cameras or detectors, depending on which. Yeah, well, yeah, okay. So if you're going TM, you're using a digital camera, which is costing. Kirk? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, they can be 80,000, 100,000, a couple hundred thousand, depending on the sensitivity of these systems. I think, yeah, uh, <laughs> they can be expensive. Um, or you can get one that's good enough uh, for a bit less than that, but it's normally in tens of thousands of range. Sure. And so, so I'm just thinking, my camera's not going to take a picture of this, is it? My phone. And and it, if you think about the chip size in this, the chip is tiny. The chip that you're looking at is almost speaker. It's huge, isn't it? The actual yeah, that's chip. Part of, yeah, that's part of the driver of the cost. Um, the more expensive chips to be able to collect the signals from electron or the yeah you know, from the electron beam. Um, you know, smaller chips are less expensive, and of course, in the phone, the quality is a little different too. And the sensitivity is is markedly for electrons, yes, <laughs> different on that. So, so Lucy, you finished on talking about neuroscience. Uh, what what sort of samples are you generally looking at yourself? Oh, could be anything. So we use volume EM for most of our projects now because, as as we say, life happens in three D. Um, the image on the bottom left there is actually from from the team from a a collaboration with Eva Frickles lab and Serge Mostovi. I think I mentioned it before. Um, that's on zebrafish and looking at toxoplasma in the zebrafish brain and trying to localize it as, as the um, fish mounts an immune response oh. to see if you can use a zebrafish as a model for disease states because they're much easier to image. Um, you can get a lot more of them than you could with a mouse model. And what would the typical disease states be that this would then be used for to study, which would bring it back to human relevance as well? Um, we've used volume EM to look at HIV infected cells, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis in cells. Uh, that one's toxoplasma. We look at plasmodium, which causes malaria. Um, we're looking at tumor tissues at the moment and how the metabolism of tumor tissue uh, changes is kind of very heterogeneous even within a single tumor. Um, oh. No, 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 it's a, it's a huge variety. <laughs> so and that's just run, on these. On, yeah, on yeah we run around 60 projects a year, and each 60. of them will be, yes, and most of them will be volume EM, and each of them will be on something something different. And Kirk again will be working on uh, I'll, 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 Yeah, on getting to You've got 60 projects. <laughs> 60 projects. Sorry, 100 projects a year with 60 teams. Oh, the data. Yeah. I will come to data later on, but this, that, 
A, the time on the microscope to do this is huge because it's not the fastest experiment in the world. And then the date, how many instruments do you have? We've got six electron, six big electron microscopes of different flavors. So we can pick and choose them according to what's needed for each project. And then we have X-ray microscopes and light microscopes and a few bench top microscope, uh, electron microscopes, which are small enough that you can put them in the boot of your car and drive them around if you wish. Okay. So you've got a basic all sorts of electron microscopes. I, I, I love the idea. And Kirk, I, I noticed on this, we've got plants as well, which is kind of where you major, isn't it? Yeah, uh, um, I, I consider myself uh, um, biological and soft material, so I, I would go beyond that just in my career. But now I'm focused on plants, which have special challenges. Uh, and uh, um, to get volume EM to work, uh, one of the challenges with volume EM is, is that you're, you have samples in a, in a non-conductive resin often. And so part of the, the efforts of the of the, the, of the of the community is to find protocols that help improve that. And one of the efforts I have is, is uh, been making sure that plants get enough signal out of them and enough conductivity that we can get high quality images. Okay, I, I kind of get it, what Lucy said, you know, looking at how the parasites, how infections actually affecting the ultrastructure of the cells and where it's been found in the cells and how it's changing. What's the use in plants? Why are we interested? Uh, okay, so we'll go a little bit further. Um, you know, part of the, the the thing about the plants that I was talking to is it made it a little bit harder to interrogate them, but there's a lot of things. So plants, just like um, other organisms, have development. So we do look at a lot of development, how the root grows, how the shoot grows. The other thing we look at is how pathogens are invading. So we can go in and inside of the plants and inspect how pathogens are causing disease, how the plant responds to it. Those are just um, some simple examples. The other thing is, is that, of course, there's phenotype variations with crops that are resistant to drought, for example, or you know climate change. So we're trying to understand what cellular um, improvements that a plant can uh, have. Get subcellular using volume EM, we can actually learn from that and help develop improved plants. Okay, so, so I, I, I have a question for both of you, actually. Why isn't everyone doing it? Who's going to answer that one right, first? I will definitely make a comment on that too. <laughs> Go on, Lucy. Uh, because the instruments are big, they're like a few tons each. They're expensive. They need very special rooms to house them. So at the Crick, we're actually in, a, in an extremely challenging environment to put those microscopes. So they're, they're all on anti-vibration bases to remove uh, physical and acoustic vibration. And then they all have six-sided shielded boxes to remove the electromagnetic fields coming from the train stations and the tubes passing us. Um, I don't think it's that much more difficult to train somebody to operate some of these instruments than to operate a high-end light microscope nowadays. I think people sometimes think that's the the issue, but the the hardest thing I think is the sample preparation because we use lots of toxic me metals. Um, we have to slice the samples, which is very difficult. Um, I think that's the thing that stops most people from implementing it in their own labs. Okay. Kirk? Yeah, I would just add to that. I agree with everything that Lucy said. Um, you know, the, the reality is a lot of it is about awareness is probably one of the reasons why we both are here today. Um, you know, it's out there. There's a few groups that have been working. And the good news is that they've actually solved a lot of the problems that made this not is easy to adapt. I think things have changed. And um, now I think our efforts are to um, help educate um, other laboratories that could quickly uh, plug in and start using this, this type of technology. That's, I, I am going to jump because if you ask, you know, if you'd have gone back five, even just five, six years ago and said, Pete, you know, a user comes, Pete, I want to get into this. I'd have gone, great, but you're going to have to commit a huge amount of resource to it. And it's, it's staff resource because Lucy, you touched on all those projects. How much data is coming off these microscopes? Um, per microscope on our standard volume electron microscopes, somewhere between 50 and 250 gigabytes per day. But the new systems that are coming through will go into terabytes per hour. So at the at, for a small sample, then 
we can do some manual low throughput image analysis, which then allows us to interpret what we're seeing in a normal sample versus a drug treated, something like that. But you very quickly get into the regime where you just can't analyze all of the data that you have so, manually. So that's that's where you need to move to automated techniques. Yeah, so so that that's so so obviously you can share data. Yeah. Okay, so so I don't know who wants to talk about M I, I say this is sorry, coming at a random order with this, but I think it's important because it's not just a sharing of data, it's how long it would it have taken you to analyze, to segment the data uh, six, seven years ago? So we use the nucleus of one cell as an example, and we still have, we, we have some algorithms to pick out the nucleus, but we still do a lot of segmentation manually because the algorithms don't work on every single cell and tissue type that you uh, challenge them with. So for a single nucleus in a single cell, it takes one of our experts about a week to segment it. So it's just not sustainable because quite often we're imaging pieces of tissue. And if you're interested in the nuclei, there might be 50 or 100 nuclei, and then you're into, you know, yeah. eight years work doing nothing else. Um, data sharing is extremely important because we just can't, even if we're using automated algorithms to analyze the data, they're normally only looking at one structure. And you can see in the images that Kirk and I have up that each image, so this is a 3D cut through a cell with the nucleus in the middle, we've got mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum and other organelles. So if your research question is about mitochondria, which power the cells and you make 3D models of all of the mitochondria in the cells, somebody else might be able to use the same data, especially if it's a, a control cell and segment out the nucleus because that's what they're interested in or the endoplasmic reticulum, which is making proteins. So the data is so rich, one team won't usually use the whole lot, even if they're generating it. And the Empire is the electron microscopy public image archive, which is held up at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory European Bioinformatics Institute, or EMBL EBI, as it's much easier to say. Um, so that was set up, first of all, to hold EM images from cryo transmission electron microscopy, um, but now takes depositions of images from all different types of volume EM and X-ray imaging. And that means that the, the data gets out to other scientists, not just um, biological researchers who might want to reuse it and reanalyze it, but also computational scientists who might want to develop new algorithms to analyze that data. And Empire is growing very quickly. You can see this from, I don't know which way I'm pointing. Uh, behind Pete, it says two petabytes. So they reached two petabytes worth of image data in 2022, and they're almost up to three petabytes now. And I'd imagine that's not all the data that's been generated. That's just what's been uploaded. Yes. And normally, normally data sets that are associated with a publication or have been produced as example uh, data sets for a specific use, like image analysis. Um, so there's a big push in the community to try and increase the number of depositions, particularly associated with, with papers so that other people can really dig into the raw data. So, so this is cool. So it's, it's, it's gone from from what my biggest hold up with this was was the speed of uh, analysis. It wasn't the acquisition; it was the analysis side that was the, that was the rate limiting step, which is getting faster. Uh, you mentioned the sharing of data. Uh, we've talked about the different techniques, or some of the techniques. We haven't got there fully yet. I'm going to challenge you on that in a minute, and that'll probably be cut come and get with both of you at that point. But I think a big thing when you're sharing data, when you're learning new techniques as a community, and you mentioned the community sharing data. So how, how have the community got together? So there have been different groups of the community that got together at different times, but the, the current community effort with the nice logos that you can see behind us for VEM, that really started in 2019. And again, actually, Empire and the e EMBL EBI 
were really important in that. So I was up in Cambridge at their scientific advisory board meeting and over dinner, which is where all the good ideas happen. Um, I was chatting to Ardan Patwardan and Herard Klyvecht. Uh, there's Herard at the back in the green t-shirt and Luigi Martino from the Wellcome Trust. Perfect. Um, so a lot of the scientific advisory board and a lot of what um, um, the molecular cell structure team were focused on was it a huge field of protein structure and structural biology. And I was there for cells and tissues. So just starting to, to see the deposition of images of cells and tissues from so EM. The outlier, I presume, at this yep. point. <laughs> yes. Uh, then there's a picture actually Lucy sent in and she's right on the end, just showing just how much of an outlier she was to the rest of the structural biologists. To, to squeeze into the public archives. Um, so over dinner, we were talking about how quickly this technology is having an impact in, in biology and actually how often it's the data is included in publications, um, but you don't necessarily know it's there because EM is, has been around for a very, very long time. Unless you dig into it, you don't realise it's volume EM. And from that came the idea of the first community meeting, which Luigi organised and hosted at the Wellcome Trust in 2019. And we had around 60 experts so that was end users, biologists, for whom it was really important. Um, we had Ollie Flory talking from um, Cambridge on how it's been used in cancer research. Um, and then we had the microscopists, the imaging scientists, people from companies involved in volume EM, data scientists. And then in 2020, obviously everything had to move online. We had a second town hall meeting and from that we had the formation of six working groups. So behind you, you've got pictures of all the co-leads for the volume EM uh, working groups. So we have six working groups, community outreach, sample prep, data training and infrastructure. Um, and I should mention actually that infrastructure was chaired first of all um, by Charlie Wood and Cheng Cheng and Paul and I have recently taken over. But it's it's these people who have volunteered their own time, it's not part of their day jobs, to organize the working groups. And that at that point, there were about 70 working group members uh, distributed across the groups. It's now more than 80. And they, in two years, they've delivered huge amounts in terms of connecting the community, resources for the community, um, telling people what volume EM is and how you can use it. So trying to increase its impact throughout the biosciences and the clinical sciences um, and really putting it on the map, which helps help science because you're, <laughs> you're um, letting everybody know that the technique is there and that it can reveal new insights into important biological questions, um, but also pushing the development of the technique forward as it gets better known and attracts funding. And behind you, there's a map of the distribution of the current um, so, working group members. It is truly global. It, it is in every, con every, every practical continent. Yeah. But there's a huge concentration of people in the UK because it started in the UK. So after that, so that first meeting was also organized with Paul Vicarda from Bristol and Herard Ardan, Paul and I, the, the, the working group members, really nucleated in the UK. And then the last year or so has been really pushing out to try and be more and more international because you can see there's volume electron microscopists everywhere and it's all about networking and that's where Kirk comes in. I was about to say, so this this, this is so, uh, Chan Zuckerberg comes into so many of the different podcasts for many different reasons. Uh, so Kirk, the community side, I mean, it, it's moving on and it's moving fast and it's still open to everyone. Yeah, so um, I actually, I was, an, um, I was actually in an industry. Uh, once I came back into academia, um, once I learned about the volume EM group, and of course, we work with all of this, these uh, folks um, that are in these pictures uh, all the time. Um, I joined the group and 
Um, we were always interested in, you know, there's only so much free time we can dedicate towards it as a group. And I think it was really, really, really beneficial. But we recognized if we had some funds, some of our initiatives could really accelerate this forward. And so um, as a group, we decided to submit an application uh, for the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and uh, specifically to build resources and expand our global community and to emphasize outreach and dissemination. And now we have funds to do that. Um, actually, the funding just started a, a few months ago, or, and we have a team, a program manager, a community officer, and resources to help um, develop some software. Uh, and um, this is very exciting for us because now we can really accelerate it, have higher quality material um, to teach people the nuances of the sample prep, which Lucy Rudley said is one of the bigger challenges and so forth. So it's very, very exciting. I mean, I, there's many examples of, of what we're trying to do here, but right now we're just getting the funds to kick that off. And, and this isn't a closed shop, is it? You, you, you've got these groups, these working groups, you're up to 70 people, but I presume it's still open for anyone to join. Definitely. It's been as open as we can possibly make it the whole way through. So all of our documentation is um, available to everybody. Everything's shared on on Google Drives. Um, the community is really friendly. And I think it's because the sample preparation is so difficult and so long that as electron microscopists, we don't want everybody to go through the same pain as us. So ever, ever since I've been an electron microscopist, everybody always supports each other and helps each other with protocols and tips and tricks. And I think the same thing rolls over into the community as well. So if anybody is interested and wants to join, we would love to have you as part of this. And there's, you can get in touch through, there's a volume EM website. Um, we have a Twitter page. I've got, I've got to keep up with this. So got to... <laughs> we have a, a list server, which all of the details of the list server on the volume EM website as well. So you can join that and get news from us. And, and there's a chance of convert links as well, Kirk. I'm sorry, uh, I'll add comment, but uh, what was your question again, Pete? Uh, so it's not anyone can join. I oh, yes, sure. And, and actually, I wanted to actually add that and uh, a couple of really important things. Um, one of them is it's not just the labs that are doing the work or running the, the core facilities. Um, it is also we're bringing commercial entities to listen in and what our pain points are. Because in the end, we're not building electron microscopes with the vast majority of laboratories. So we depend on them giving us the tools we need to. And they've been listening quite well. But as a community, I think we can improve that. So I wanted to actually add that as one of the groups. Um, the second part of it is, and I actually want to emphasize this for those who are listeners on here, um, if you go to volumeem.org, two E, so V O V O L U M E E M dot O R G, um, you will get the all the information you need. Sorry, I have to be able to read that. Uh, uh, Pete, that's your fault. Your head was in the way of the words. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so you'll get our our Twitter account. Thanks, and, and uh, Facebook and everything else that we're on um, in there. Oh. Do you want to just repeat the link? Yeah, www.volumeem.org. Uh, and if you go there, you'll actually get a great start. And not only that, as the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative uh, really starts taking off and we have our new videos and our resources all consolidated, um, you'll be able to keep up with everything we're doing. Okay. Well, Comment. That map was beautiful. The reality is, my guess is we're only reaching about a third of the existing labs already, and of course, we'd love that to double. Um, I just, you know, this is no actual data to support that, but I know there's a lot of other my colleagues and friends that aren't there, and we're going to work to try to bring them into our, our group. I, I, I've got to say, so for those listening, you may not appreciate this, but there, uh, there was an image here of the who was awarded for the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and, and there's a big call out to lots of people who I'm familiar with. But I noticed that Kirk is twice as big as anyone else <laughs> on this picture. I, I thought that that's vanity, isn't it? I, I, I got to tell you that that was actually following the format of the Chan Zuckerberg edition. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Uh, everybody who was LPI got the big head. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely would have been happy to be uh, just like everyone else. I think it's well deserved for all the work you have to do putting, you know, the paperwork together for these grant, grant applications. That's it. Yeah, okay, so this is sounding like a great community, everything else, but 
what's the biggest challenges that you're facing now? I don't know who wants to pick up that first. I'll just make, um, and I think you've already touched upon this, but, you know, we've gotten really good at collecting a lot of data. It's amazing that every minute I can get a slice, you know, in a thousand minutes, I can get a thousand slices that are, you know, oftentimes pretty close to register. But it is, as Lucy alluded to earlier, it's a bit like drinking out of a fire hose. So I think one of the things is, is that, you know, this, you know, we, we need a pain point to drive the innovation here. So in my view, one of the things will be um, faster segmentation, volume, and being able to manage all of that data is one of the key challenges. And that's in my perspective. There are many others, but that's one that I think about every day because I have a vision of so many exper experiments. Um, I can do lots of smaller things now, but I'm moving towards the bigger and I can't wait for the tools to become more efficient um, and make it even faster so that um, maybe smaller labs can uh, even get bigger benefit. Okay. Lucy? Yeah, I agree. Uh, the data side has to change. And I think, yeah, so your background now is showing a figure from a paper called The Mind of a mouse and I love this figure because it makes it so easy to communicate the <laughs> the next steps in volume electron microscopy or something else but we assume at the moment it'll be volume EM so um I said earlier that we that the mind of the worm has been mapped at least uh, from some worms and now the connectomics community which focuses on generating these uh, maps of the connections of neurons uh, the connectomics community is working on the, the fly brain and has started delivering fly brains. But the next challenge is going to be the mind of the mouse. And if the challenge of mapping the mind of the worm was the width of one airline seat, then the challenge of mapping the mind of the fly is the uh, size of six and a half Boeing 747 airliners. And by the time you get to the mouse, then you're talking about the distance from Boston to Lisbon. So the, the scale increase in challenge across the entire pipeline in sample preparation in imaging speed and imaging volumes and then in data analysis is almost unimaginable, in, unimaginable at the moment. Um, and the effort to get to the mouse brain will deliver us the next generation of imaging technology. And, and to, to, uh, Jeff Lickman, uh, I don't know if you listen, I know, Lucy, I know, actually, thank you for being an avid microscopist listener uh, on your tube or on the bus on the way home. I get messages from Lucy every now and then saying, I can't believe you just said that. That's really funny or whatever else. I can't believe someone else just said that. That's shocking. Uh, I, so you must have heard Jeff Lickman's and talking about similar type of work as well. Uh, you also sent these yes images. so i think this is another big challenge so the the delivery of the the mind of the mouse is one and the, the first effort will be delivering the the structure of the the connections between the neurons but then we have interesting areas here in correlative and multimodal imaging so that's where you connect different types of imaging together, like light microscopy, x-ray microscopy, iron microscopy, and electron microscopy. And you start to layer different types of information on top of each other. So that might be showing you where the molecules are in the brain or, or where chemicals are in the brain. Um, and, uh, like epilepsy or in brain tumors. And when you add those layers of information, then you start to really get to the, the differences in health and disease. But we we can't at the moment image across all of the scales from atoms or even macromolecules, whole proteins, through to organisms on a single sample. But you can see in these two images, so on the left, you have a nature methods piece highlighting in situ structural biology, and that's a fairly new field where people are imaging native protein structures inside cells using beautiful cryo samples. Um, so all of these molecules encased in ice. And then 
on the right hand side, you have volume correlative light and EM. So that's where we link, say, light microscopy with volume EM. And you have a really nice example there of spatial transcriptomics, where you can see which genes are being expressed in which cells and the, the cells you can see in volume EM. And these experiments are extremely difficult where you're really identifying molecules in the context of, of the structure of cells. So linking those two communities is really a, a grand challenge and being able to move seamlessly across the scales. Um, that's a tough one. Okay. And moving on, <clears throat> what other initiatives are there? In the community, I, I, we've heard about Chan Zuckerberg, we've heard about yourself. Are there other initiatives, are there other groupings that are closely related? Yes, no? You can speak about the, the, the Gordon Conference that's coming up. Oh, so, okay, so, so, so how, go on, what conference would you go to to learn more? <laughs> yes, so Kirk already gave that one away. <laughs> Actually, there are quite more details. <laughs> We, we have to give a plug for the first volume electron microscopy Gordon Research Conference, which is going to be chaired by Paul Vicardra and myself. Um, and then that will happen this year in July in California. And then in two years time, when it will be chaired, I think, by Yannick Schwab and Kedar Narayan, who are both like key members of the volume EM and volume CLEM communities as well. So that's going to be a lot of fun. The registration is still open and you just search for volume EM GRC and that should come up. But there are other key conferences that have been going on for, for a while, including the Zeiss 3D LM EM meeting, which was first organized by Chris Gerwin um, at the IB in Ghent and now moves between there and with uh, Saskia Lippins and Annika Kramer and then goes to EMBL Heidelberg with Yannick, and then will come to Crick um, with us. And there are meetings springing up everywhere, and there are dedicated set volume EM sessions and a lot of the big microscopy conferences now. It's interesting, if you think about the, the one that started with Chris and then moved to Yannick over to uh, EMBL, and then now coming over to your sexy swap between themselves and then now into London as well with yourself, Lucy, which is sponsored by Zeiss. Uh, but you know, they're not the only players on the scene. But I've got to say, I think all the companies have played quite a critical role in the development of volume EM. Uh, you know, this is not just an academic endeavor, is it? You know, how important are the companies for this? And actually, I, Kirk, you come from a, a commercial background, you, you flitted to commercial and then back into academia. What's your thoughts on the role of? companies in this um okay i would say that it's key and because of my hybrid commercial academic background and working in a company that was actually developing these techniques um it's huge in, in fact i would make a comment even things like the mind of the mouse these key thought leaders these lighthouse customers that are working on these technologies actually give us a problem to solve and then once we, uh, when I was in that capacity, I would say at the time, um, once we try to solve their challenge, it'll cascade down for the rest of the group. So it is, is instrumental. Of course, um, uh, all of these companies are excited, I think, about this um, you know, recent attention to volume EM because they've been putting energy in developing tech detectors and you know automation of the software. So this becomes automated. By the way, I will make a comment they have done a great job on the automation. There's still more room for improvement, but the fact that I don't have to have an operator to sit there for three days in a row catching slices is huge. That is because of what the manufacturers ha have done. I would say I want manufacturers to do more. I want them to think about the downstream side of things and how do we take all of that data? And if they can engage on that, then we have like a full workflow. That's my, my comment, it's, it's critical. That's why we want in the volume EM community to keep them engaged. They are doing that, um, but I think um, it's exciting. Lucy, any other comments or thoughts on that side? Oh, just to agree that the yeah, the manufacturers are absolutely critical in this because the these kind of instruments you can't build them in your own lab. You you can set the challenge and you can have some ideas and you can make some modifications, but 
um it really takes the the big companies and the the experts they have in them to design the systems that are going to answer the science so i'm going to give a shout out to zeiss at this point who actually kindly sponsored this podcast but not because of that that first meeting in vib was was put together from zeiss they brought together not just the leading electron microscopies, but they brought together some of the biggest light microscopies across the world and put this all in the same room. You know, and and, and then into groups that brainstormed and then came out with ideas. I, and there were some big names in there uh, that wouldn't that would not naturally come together and talk. Uh, but I, I would say that's where the community, well, for me, that's where the community really started because that put people together. It made that those connections. And, and Lucy, you were there at that meeting. I wasn't at I that was, one, actually. I, I, I was. I was at that one. <laughs> oh, my God. How come I was at that one? You weren't at that one. That's the thing. You have the community seeding in different places. So KDAR as well in the US had uh, held what he called a micro lab and brought 50 experts together to discuss what needed to be done to to push the field forward and put to answer science. So you get these different nucleation points all happening around the same time. And now I think, you know, everybody's come together, which is amazing. Yeah. Can I make one other comment? Um, uh, and this is really key. Um, one of the drivers that will ensure that we can continue to move forward is not only the technology development, but it's also the realization from the funding agencies how critical um, having this these types of platforms and, and, um, and enough institutions that we can continue to, to grow what's possible and, and improve the science because we have all of this additional insights that just doesn't come across in a two-dimensional reach. I agree, and there aren't that many facilities that have... There are quite a few facilities that might have one volume EM modality but there aren't many that have lots. And what we're seeing now is the bigger your sample, the more you need to tie together the different volume EM imaging modalities to work from bigger scales, to isolate smaller pieces, to image at higher resolution, to really get down to the subcellular level. So there's only a few places around the world that have most of the volume EM modalities in one place to make them really flexible and not able to answer any biological question. Cool. And John, the, the other really good thing about the community, I would say the gender balance within it is pretty good. Yeah, you know, if I go back to those early meetings and think about Judith Plumperman, you know, leading on one of the tables, you've got yourself, Lucy, you've got Jemima, you've got Rafi, you've got this whole community, uh, which I think is actually also fairly unique you know to have such a fairly gender equal community i think that's quite something the community should be proud of and carry on embracing as well yes and i remember that did tend to be the case even back when i first got into electron microscopy which is really unusual and i'm not sure how that came about but then um we need to work on our other types of diversity and make sure that everybody has the opportunity to get into this kind of high technology so that we have the best minds from everywhere working on it. So I have two more bits before we wrap up. And the first one is actually, if you want to learn more about this, there's quite a lot of uh, information out there. Uh, so there's different online resources. I think Lucy, you involved in some of these? Uh, this is actually the training group. Um, so this is Erin and Rafa and um, everybody in that working group who've built some um, slides that show how you build toolkits. So if you're just getting into array tomography or focused ion beam SEM or serial block face SEM for the first time, there are some slides that show you things that you should get together. So for array tomography there, you've got an eyelash stuck to a cocktail stick, which you need to move your sections around your boat of water when you cut them on your diamond knife. Do you use students to make sure you've got enough eyelashes? Because you don't have my eyelashes. <laughs> so it's always voluntary we never make anybody give us their eyelashes um but different people have different uh eyelashes and some are better than others so martin jones who's actually in charge of um microscopy prototyping in our team which is much more computational and engineering based apparently has extremely good eyelashes and i think Anne's used 
hairs from her dogs in the past as well. Apparently, oh, Dalmatians yeah. are particularly good. I can't wait to see Martin. Next time I see Martin, he's going to wonder why I'm like this close to him. He has still got eyelashes. <laughs> Intensely, but not quite making eye contact. Just look at his eyelash. He's going to, he's, he's going to, yeah, super weird. Are you going to try to grab an eyelash or you're just going to look at him? No. <laughs> Pre warning. So we don't pull them out. You wait for them to fall out and then collect them. Health and safety first. Well, mine, mine don't fall out. Get away. And <laughs> mine are useless, so keep off. Uh, and there's also a load of movies that aren't there. So there's there's clips and movies that you can go. Where can you find this information? So this is all on the Volume EM website and there's a page for training movies. So again, this is the training working group who be making some fantastic videos. But Kirk, you're going to be carrying this on, aren't you? Yes. Yep. So we'll be adding to the uh, the, the great starting content there's now. And uh, yeah, again, volumeem.org. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, O-R-G. You say that so quick, it does sound a bit like orgy. Uh, <laughs> I, I, that's that's really on you, to be honest with you. <laughs> it really isn't. Anyone listening, all they're going to hear is orgy, O-R-G, just, just. Anyway. I'll O-R-G. speak more slowly. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> no one's going to forget the address now. <laughs> <laughs> One final question. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Kirk, on this. What's the best public if you're coming into em for the volume em for the first time what would be the best publication to read oh um actually i'm there, there are so many out there you, okay i'm just going to make a comment to you i think you made the comment in the beginning there are many different techniques and it really depends on what you might have access to in your laboratory but i think uh, lucy has uh, put out a primer last year um and maybe lucy you can describe a little bit about where they can find that um which would be my recommendation as a first source because it kind of consolidates these together and gives you the, the source literature uh, that some of it's based on yeah so that was in nature uh reviews methods primers um at the moment it's not on their open source um but chris is getting it up onto europe pmc but you can drop me an email if you'd like a copy and that was bringing together we were really lucky we got some key experts from across the volume em pipeline to write on it so it's i would go there it's written for people who are just coming into volume electron microscopy to give you an overview of the techniques and the applications and it mentions the community we just have a piece out with nature methods a comment as well um, which was Herard, his idea, um, but then written with Paul and Ardan and with all of the um, working group co-chairs that describes what we've been talking about today, how the community came together and how you can get involved and all of the resources that are available. And so any other resources you go to publication-wise for people to read to get a grasp of it? One of my favourites... I have to say is um, Shan Shu's paper with Harold Hess and Song Pang working on the the sample preparation where they they describe the next generation of focused ion beam SEMs, which they call enhanced FIBs. And and Shan and the the team uh, spent ten years working on these systems to make them more stable and to run for longer time periods. And then Shan lined up. Uh, with Harold, 10 of them in a row to run uh, pieces of fly brain in parallel to get to bigger volumes. And it's just the most astonishing piece of work. It kind of references what happens in the semiconductor industry where you really do li- line up folks iron beams to look at um, computer chips and things like that. But porting that over to biology, and I think it's an indication of um, across the entire pipeline, how we might uh, move forward into more quantitative imaging at the nanoscale. Yeah, and I, I'm just going to round off. I, there are so many different techniques, strategies for doing volume EM that I think the resources that you've spoken about are the, are the starting point for anyone wanting to do it or to find someone in the community and just talk to them. Yep. Sometimes, often the best way is just email, phone, Zoom, whatever it is, yep. and just you know, pick an expert. I, it's a really communicative community that is always happy to help and welcomes 
the most dumb questions. So thank you for tolerating my dumb questions today. <laughs> uh, and I was going to say there's no such thing as a stupid question, but <laughs> yeah, but then you've met me, so thank you, Lucy. <laughs> I, I Kirk knows me all too well for that stuff. <laughs> yeah, you're pretty tame today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, professional mode. Yeah. Uh, so, Kirk, Lucy, uh, is there anything else you'd just like to add before we finish? I should give you one last word. Is there anything I've missed that you'd like to say? Uh, two, two things. I actually want to double click. Um, you know, the reality is, is that it really depends on the biological question and which tool is appropriate. And to someone just walking into this tomorrow, it may not be obvious. So definitely reach out. I mean, it could be myself or Lucy or even um, the Volume community. You can send off a little note and you'll get lots of feedback from people who care. Second thing is, is that nice little Clamidomonas sample. I wanted to make sure that it's clear that that actually is on Empire. So anybody can look at the raw underlying data for that and um, Jürgen Plitzko from the Max Planck Institute for allowing us to to uh, to use it. And Lucy? Maybe just that there's no way that we could name all of the people involved in the community and there's no way that we could name check everybody who's developed these techniques. We really are standing on the shoulders of giants. So if you want to know how any of these techniques were first developed, then go read the stories in the literature. Yeah, and guys, I, I, I'm going to say it's not just those early developments. It's the it's the application being put to them. It's making it widely available. And so actually, I would say you're both pioneers. Yeah, so you, you may be looking on the shoulders of giants, but actually you're, you're standing with the giants to make this accessible to everyone, to put the applications to, to make it relevant. And it's great having those initial things, but to actually make it work. And do the science is amazing. So on that note, while well, I've flattered you both, uh, you can buy. I can't remember what conference we're going to meet at next, but you now both owe me a drink. I'd just like to say thank all of the listeners, and I would encourage you to watch the YouTube because there are some super cool movies in there if you want to. Uh, thanks for listening to the microscopy today. Thank you to Kurt. Thank you to Lucy. And I just point out, I think you've heard Judith Plumperman's name, you've heard Jeff Lickman, you've heard Harold Hess, uh, Mark Ellisman, Yannick Schwab, Lucy herself all guests on the microscopy so you can hear more about them in person and i'm bound to have missed someone off that list in the volume em uh, but just the names that came through quickly everyone thank you don't forget to subscribe but do you know what thank you so much lucy thank you so much Kerr. you've been stars keep thanks. it up thanks Pete. thank you for listening to the microscopists a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by zeiss microscopy to view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.